Uh, we're going to be continuing through our, the book of Matthew together uh, in Matthew chapter 12, verses 22 through 37. And I realize I downloaded it, but I didn't put it in there, so don't worry about it. Okay? All right. So, Matthew chapter 12, verses 22 through 37. You'll have to join along because it's not going to be with you on the screen, so you've got a Bible. Pull that out. I want to say for a moment uh, that it has been really exciting to, to be working with our youth to see how they have really just been on fire for the Lord and their own lives, that they've been seeking uh, to reach out to their friends. They've been seeking to follow God faithfully in their life and to see how they've been doing that, to see how they've been uh, seeking to just honor God in their life. But I want to uh, reiterate something with you that, you know, I've spoken many times as we continue to try to be the church that God wants us to be, as we continue to try to reach out and to grow, that one of the places that if we looked around uh, that we can see starting to change is that we needed to reach young people. And we can see how God's starting to work in and through that. But I want to make one thing clear with that, is that when I say that, and when I, every time I've said that, the reason is because the ultimate goal is that the church will always be a multi-generational church, which means from birth to 100 and beyond, every age should be represented and every age should be actively involved and actively serving and actively growing together. And every time I've ever said, we got to reach younger people, it's because for a period of time, we haven't had them here. And we're still working on that. We're still growing for that. But what I can tell you for sure is that this church would not be where it is without the people who have been here and been faithful and put their blood and their sweat and their tears into this church over their years and years they've been here and served. And still to this day, one of the things that's just as exciting to me as seeing the youth excited and serving the Lord is when we come for something like a funeral bereavement meal. And I see faithful members who are doing everything they can to love on people, to serve and they've done that for years and years, and, and with God's will, they will continue to be able to do that. But I want that to be really clear that every person in this church, no matter how long you've been here, no matter how old you are, no matter how long you've followed Christ for, you need to be a part of serving God and being a part of his kingdom. We've got to invest in those that are younger than us. We've got to look to and love those that are older than us, and all the way in between, that's who we are called to be as a church, the family of God. And so with that, we're going to talk about uh, a house divided is the title of today's sermon in Matthew 12, 22 through 37. We're going to see as last week we talked about Jesus being the Lord of the Sabbath and how after he heals the man, the Pharisees are seeking to kill him. It's a really strange reaction to seeing a miracle of God performed if you're a religious leader. That'd be like if someone came down here and did something miraculous. It was clearly the will of God. And then I'm just like, man, I want to kill that person. It's a strange reaction. It's an ungodly reaction. They're revealing their heart. And we're going to see that continue in this passage because the Pharisees are starting to show where their heart is. They're starting to show that they are far from the God they claim to serve. So we're going to start reading in verse 22 of chapter 12, go through, going through verse 37. Then they brought him a demon-possessed man who was blind and mute, and Jesus healed him so that he could both talk and see. All the people were astonished and said, could this be the son of David? But when the Pharisees heard this, they said, it is only by Beelzebub, the prince of demons, that this fellow drives out demons. Jesus knew their thoughts, and he said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself will be ruined, and every city or household divided against itself will not stand. If Satan drives out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then can his kingdom stand? And if I drive out demons by Beelzebub, by who do your people drive them out? So then they will be your judges. But if I drive out demons by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Or again, how can anyone enter a strong man's house and carry off his possessions unless he first ties up the strong man? Then he can rob his house. He who is not with me is against me, and he who does not gather with me scatters. And so I tell you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven men, but the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit 
will not be forgiven. Anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven, but anyone who speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven, either in this age or in the age to come. Make a tree and its fruit will be good. Make a, good, a tree good and its fruit will be good. Or make a tree bad and its fruit will be bad. For a tree is recognized by its fruit. You brood of vipers, how can you who are evil say anything good? For out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. The good man brings good things out of the good stored up in him. And the evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in him. But I tell you that men will have to give account on the day of judgment for every careless word they have spoken. For by your words you will be acquitted, and by your words you will be condemned. Let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Father, we thank you for this day you've given us to gather together, to, to worship you, to sing your praises, to respond to all that you've done for us, and also to look at your word, to see what it is that you say to us, to see what it is that you're calling us to do today. And Lord, I pray that you would convict us, you would show us what your will is for our life, that you would show us where we need to make corrections in our life, that you would show us where we need to honor you and faithfully follow you and serve you. Lord, I pray that you'd be with us, that you would open our eyes to your truth, that you would convict us and, and reveal your will to us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So as we look at this passage today, one of the, the things I want us to start with, and the thing that is one of the central themes of this passage, is that you will know a tree by its fruit. You will know a tree by its fruit. And so as we, as we look at this passage, then they, this is the crowds, the crowds have been following Jesus at this point, and they bring to him a demon-possessed man who is blind and mute, that Jesus healed so that he could both talk and see. I want you to think about this act in and of itself. A blind man that is blind and mute is brought, who is demon-possessed, to Jesus. And Jesus, what he does is performs a miracle that changes this man's life. He drove out the demon, and he is now able to both talk and see. So this man who was once kind of had no prospects, had no hope to be able to live a normal life, demon-possessed, blind and mute, now his whole life has been radically changed, changed from an encounter with Jesus. If you reflect on your life, Hopefully you can say the same thing, that an encounter with Jesus has radically changed your life. Maybe it wasn't from a demon possession or blindness or the inability to speak, but Jesus saves us from the things that afflict us, the sin for which we would be found guilty if we were to stand before God. And so the people are astonished, the Bible said. I want you to think about the word astonished for a moment. If you were to go through your life and think about the times you've been astonished, that's the moment you cannot believe what you've seen. Now, I'll tell you a time I was kind of astonished. I went uh, with, in college, we did some traveling with uh, this group that I was a part of, and we went to New York and we saw Aladdin on Broadway, and it was fantastic. But the thing that astonished me was that in the seat that I was in, I was kind of to the right, over kind of, it would be like this section toward the stage. And so when the genie's doing his trick, it's all illusions, right? He put, they put the little, uh, like a piece of fabric in front of this area where they're making something disappear. But I could see behind the fabric, and I cannot tell you how that thing disappeared, but it sure did. And I was astonished. I couldn't believe it. Talked about it the rest of the night. Still remember it today. That was eight years ago. These people were astonished, and they say, could this be the son of David? Now, to be really clear, they're not wondering, is, is this not really Joseph's son, but it's David's son? We got it all mixed up. At one point, we thought he was Joseph's. No. What they mean is King David, because it was spoken of very clearly that the Messiah would be in the lineage of David. The Messiah would come in the lineage of David. And so when they say, could this be the son of David, they're saying, could this be the Messiah that we've been waiting for? Why? because they've seen him do what only God can do to drive out the demons, to heal the blind, to heal the mute. Is this the Messiah? So the Pharisees don't like Jesus. They've already seen him heal, heal someone that was uh, paralyzed. They wanted to kill him for it. 
And now they've seen him heal a, a demon-possessed man and a man that couldn't speak and couldn't see, who now can. And their reaction to when they hear people questioning, is this the Messiah? They don't think back to all of their learning, their great learning. They're the best spiritual leaders. They know the Torah. They know God's word. Their response isn't to say, huh, you know, I think there was something in there about him setting the captives free. And there's something in there about him healing the people, the mute speaking, the blind seeing. I think there might have been some stuff in there about that. No, their response, no, no, no. He drives out demons by the prince of demons. Why? They refuse to accept who Jesus is. Jesus being the Son of God threatens them because Jesus has already pronounced judgment on them, that they don't follow God, they don't know God as they claim to. So either they accept that they are in the wrong and repent, as they should have, or they continue to stand against everything that Jesus stands for. So they say that it's only by the prince of demons that they cast out, that he casts out demons. It's where Jesus tells them that a, a house divided against itself will be ruined, and every city or household divided against itself will not stand. Now, I don't know if this is a thing in Indiana, but I know in Kentucky, the idea of a house divided is a really big thing. And maybe it's just because we're of where we're located, but in Kentucky, you can walk, drive around just about any county, anywhere you go, you're going to find a flag every once in a while that says house divided. And you got half red with a cardinal on it and half blue with a wildcat on it. Because I guess two people got married that don't agree on what sport team they should support. And they call themselves a house divided. I wonder what the marriage rate of those people is, the divorce rate. But Jesus says a house divided can't stand it. Why would Satan cast out Satan? That makes no sense. He then references the fact that there are itinerant exorcists that go around and they will drive out demons or supposed to drive out demons and they're claiming to do so on behalf of the Lord. And so he asks him, he says, if I drive out demons by Beelzebub, who do your people claim, claim to drive out demons for? So they'll be your judges. What he's kind of pointing out to them is saying, listen, I actually drove the demons out. And you have people that are trying to drive demons out too. Who are they claiming to do it on behalf of? If it's, not, if it's God, then how can you say that I'm not driving them on behalf of God? But then he says to them, if it is by the Spirit of God that I drive out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. And that is where they should have sat and thought about things and realized that they were in the wrong. Have you ever had that moment in an argument where you realized that you were wrong, maybe it's directions, you're like, you're supposed to take this exit, and the person gets off at that exit, and you realize right as you get there, and there is a restaurant that should not be there based upon your memory, that you told them the wrong thing. How far do you let them drive before you tell them, hey, we're actually going the wrong way? Sometimes we're stubborn. And sometimes when the fact is not as readily presentable. You know, after a couple hours of driving the wrong way, you don't get to your destination. It's going to be pretty clear you were wrong. The problem the Pharisees face is that their wrongness would not become clear until God, until Jesus comes back and the day of judgment is at hand. And so they can maintain their ignorance until that day comes. But what Jesus tells them is something they should have heeded the warning of. If you're wrong, if I'm driving these demons out by the Spirit of God, then the, then the, kingdom, or the, the kingdom of God has come upon you. That should be something that causes them to be afraid and repent and turn to the Lord. He then says, whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. Jesus has a mission had a mission he was partaking in. It's the same mission that we carry on as proclaiming the kingdom of, of God. And he says that whoever's not with me is against me. Whoever does not gather with me scatters. He draws a very clear line in the sand here. There's no way to be on the fence about who Jesus is. There's no way to be on the fence about what Jesus calls you to do. You are either with Jesus or you're against him. You're either doing the work alongside him or you are undoing the work, seeking to undo the work. And he says, a good tree will bear good fruit, and a bad tree will bear bad fruit. 
If you go up to a tree, you find an apple on it, what kind of tree are you going to suppose that tree is? It's an apple tree. If you go onto it, you go find a tree, and it's got something else on it, you're going to figure out that tree is this kind of tree. You know, Greg Pluchard actually helped me figure this out. In our yard, uh, we are constantly in the fall in, in threat of danger because there are things falling from the sky. It's like Chicken Little out there. Things are falling from the sky. I have been in, hit in the head at least one time. Did not feel good. And turns out they are cashews. It's a cashew tree. And they're all in this big nut. Half of them are already gone because there's giant squirrels in our yard and they're eating them all. He said, hey, that's a, that's a cashew tree. How do you know? Because this is a cashew. And he handed it to me and I ate it and said, that's a really good cashew. You know a tree by its fruit. So what Jesus is saying to them, look at what I've produced. Look at the things I'm doing. I am healing the blind. I'm healing the mute. I am driving out demons. Who do you suppose I'm connected to? Those are good things. All good things come from the Lord. Look at the Pharisees. What things are coming from them? What things come from the way they lead? What things come from the way they teach? They're opposing the good. That clearly shows there's some bad fruit in their lives. And so if we want to apply this in our life, we have to respond to the fruit that we see accordingly. This doesn't look, this does not mean looking for a reason to invalidate someone. That's what the Pharisees are trying to do. They're trying to find a way to convince themselves and others that the fruit Jesus is producing really isn't good. But it means that we look at people's lives, we look at our own lives, and we evaluate what's going on. It can be really easy in life to be cynical. It's kind of like when you meet a person that seems just a little bit too happy. There's got to be something going on there. They're a little too cheerful. Something, something's amiss. Maybe, maybe they have the joy of the Lord in their life. It's really easy when we see things happening to have the attitude of the Pharisees, because I think we naturally are inclined to that when we're in our flesh. To look for a reason why something good is not really good. But Jesus is clear that we must be unified. A house divided against itself cannot stand. And so if we are in Christ and we look around at what God is doing, we look around at how he's working among us, we've got to seek to follow where God is moving. Good trees equal good fruit. Bad trees equal bad fruit. And the question you have to consider is, how is your fruit when you evaluate your life, when you look at the things you're doing, when you look at the things you're producing, what does that fruit say about you? What does that fruit say about your relationship with God? What does that fruit say about your commitment to God? There's times where we have to make sure that, you know, there are, my yard this year is an example of this. Last year it looked so good. This year it does not look so good. Why? Why? There's weeds that have come into it. There's some disease that has taken over. I sprayed some weeds on the side of the driveway. Some of that spray got into the yard and killed some stuff it shouldn't have killed. How can you make it well again? You've got to get out the bad things. In the reality of believers, we're not Jesus. We aren't going to consistently and only ever produce perfect fruit. There's times where believers, as should not happen, do things they should not do. And when we find the disease of sin lingering in our life, we have to eliminate it so that what we produce is pure, so that what we produce is good and glorifies the Lord. The next thing we see in this passage is that your words reveal your heart. Your words reveal your heart. He says to them, you brood of vipers, how can you who are evil say anything Good, for the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. I want you to think about that. The mouth speaks what the heart is full of. Isn't that so true? That whatever's inside of you is going to come out. And sometimes, if you're honest with yourself, you're doing everything you can to keep some things from coming out. Because you know if you say that thing, you know if you react in that way, that's not going to honor or glorify God. The issue isn't what comes out. The issue 
is what's inside. From the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. A good man brings good things out of the good stored up in him, and an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in him. The question you need to ask yourself is, what are you filling your heart with? What are you filling yourself with as you go through your daily life? There was a time in my life, I remember when I was in, in middle school, this was the, right before God called me to ministry, right before God started to work really intensely in my life. I had knew God, I had been saved, I knew what it meant to follow him, I knew that I was supposed to try to honor him, but I had a period of time where I was like, why am I trying so hard? I was questioning, as we all do. And I started to be a little more lax about the things I let influence me in my life. I had friends at school that liked certain kinds of music and certain musical artists, and so I listened to them a little bit. I started to care a little bit about which movies I watched. And I began to notice that the way that I thought, the way that I acted, and the way that I viewed certain situations was influenced directly by the things that I consumed. And in your life, whether you realize it or not, everything you allow to come into you, everything you allow to influence you, is going to directly relate to what comes out of you. What is filling your heart? You see, whenever I had my relationship with God but get, get, go to another level with that, I realized there were things I had to get out of my life because they were not good for me. It's like if you want to take care of a tree, there's certain things you got to keep away from it because those things are not good for it. What's filling your heart? What is your mouth speaking? Because maybe if you're not aware of what's filling your heart, you're not aware of the contents of your heart, what is your mouth speaking? You know, one of the things that is very common is that when someone comes to church, anytime someone finds out I'm a pastor, the way they talk starts to change. I meet somebody out in public and we're just talking and, you know, there's some four-letter words I might pepper into the conversation and then they ask me what I do and I tell them and then immediately there are certain words that just disappear from the conversation. It's quite miraculous how that happens. What's happening? A person that normally is letting these things come out of them is feeling like maybe they shouldn't let those things come out of them. The problem, as I said before, isn't with what comes out, it's where it's coming from. That's like a person that has a terrible disease of their lungs and all you're trying to do is get them to quit coughing. You got to heal the source, but the cough lets you know there might be a problem. Heal the problem. Another thing, another place to take this, what is your mind thinking? Because even those things you don't let escape your mouth, the Lord knows. How many times have we looked in Matthew already? This passage says it. Jesus knew their thoughts. He knew the inclination of their hearts. How many times have you gotten through an interaction and you're proud of the way that you didn't say things, but you thought them with the intention of wanting to say them? We ought to correct what's at the inside so those things are God-honoring as well. Because the reality is that we will all be held accountable for what we say and do. You will be held accountable for what you say and do. This is one of those passages that, that, that really scares a lot of people. I know it terrified me when I was younger. We'll get to that in a moment. Every sin and slander can be forgiven, but blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven. Anyone who speaks against the Son of Man will be forgiven, but anyone who speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven, either in this age or in the age to come. Everyone will have to give account on the day of judgment for every empty word they have spoken. For by your words you'll be acquitted, and by your words you will be condemned." So this brings the question that a lot of people deal with, and I know I dealt with for a period of time in my life. What is the unforgivable sin? And if you read this passage, it talks about the unforgivable sin being the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. To blaspheme the Holy Spirit, Jesus says, you won't be forgiven in this age or in the age to come, and makes it sound pretty unforgivable. So what does that mean? I remember, uh, so the time where I was called to ministry, where I was really trying to dive into a lot of things, learn a lot, I read a passage like this, trying to figure things out. One of the questions I dealt with was, you know, hey, what is the role of the Holy Spirit in the church today? Because I see the things happening in the Bible and 
You go to church on Sunday, I'm not seeing blind people being healed. I'm, I'm wondering about how does the Holy Spirit still move? And so I'm looking into these things online, and there's a dangerous invention that still is very dangerous today called YouTube. It was much more dangerous back then because not as many people were on it. There was mostly bad information on YouTube. But what I found was a video that would look at a bunch of um, mostly like faith healing type services. You know the ones I'm talking about where people will come up and they'll, they'll be healed and all of these sorts of things. And this video was, was talking about these faith healings and it was saying that they were demonic and not of God. And in my 13-year-old mind, I'm like, I'll, I can get behind that. Then I read this passage and I was mortified. What if it was the Spirit of God? Did I just blaspheme the Holy Spirit? Am I now unforgivable? Well, here's a couple things. There's a lot of those things that are, there's a lot of people that are charlatans. And what that means is people will use God as a way to make a lot of money. How do we know this? There are verifiable cases of people who plant people in the crowd to say they have an ailment, to come forward so they can be healed in the service so people will give more money. They only let those people come forward. All the people with real ailments, they don't ever get to the stage. That happens for real. Now, here's the deal. I've heard well-meaning believers talk about things that they can't explain. And who am I to say what God can and can't do based upon what he chooses to do? So I am wary to denounce what appears to be good fruit, as I think we all should be from this passage. But there certainly is bad fruit. Did I commit the unforgivable sin? Again, I was just watching a video. It wasn't intending. Here, here's, a, here's a good rule of measure. If you are worried that you've committed the unforgivable sin, you haven't committed it. Because there's a couple ways to approach this. Uh, for one thing, we are not with Jesus as he is filled with the Spirit of God performing miracles to show the sign of the kingdom of God coming. So the sin they committed is not a sin that we could literally commit today. Because they are rejecting the Messiah. They are rejecting the movement of the Spirit of God in the Messiah. Calling it the work of Satan. When clearly it was the work of God. That is not something that we can do in the same way that they did. But how did they get to that point? Time and time again, they rejected the opportunity of God to respond to what God was doing. So if we want to consider what it would be, what is it that we cannot be forgiven for today? It is the continued rejection of what God is doing through the Holy Spirit in our lives. The refusal to submit to the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives is when we die separated from God, or when a person dies separated from God, refusing to submit to the work of the Spirit who blaspheme his work that he's seeking to do in our lives. So the, I feel like it's a fair rule of thumb to say that if you're worried that you've committed the unforgivable sin, I don't think that you have done that because your goal has not been to blaspheme the Spirit, but to seek the Lord. You see, the Pharisees knew what they were doing. They knew that he was doing good things. They knew in all likelihood, that this had to be from God, but they refused to acknowledge it. They blasphemed the Holy Spirit. And just like they will be held account for those things when they face God in judgment, we will be held account, accountable for the things that we say. It says that every empty word we've said will be held accountable to us on the day of judgment. Well, that doesn't probably make you feel very good. You probably, if you're like me, you've had lots of moments where there's things you said that you wish you could just take that back. You wish that hadn't slipped out of your mouth. You wish you had calmed down a little bit before you responded, maybe in anger. You wish that you weren't a little as hot-headed as you were. You know, the book of James in chapter 3 talks all about how the, the, the tongue, the, the words we say, can destroy, has the power to build up and to destroy. Just like a large boat is moved by a small rudder, so the mouth, the tongue has such great power. It says that with the mouth we bless God, and we curse people, and those things shouldn't be. One day we will all stand before God, and we will give account for what we've said. 
It says, for your wor- by your words you will be acquitted, and by your words you will be condemned. And here's the reality of that statement that Jesus says. By your words you'll be acquitted, and by your words you'll be condemned. I can promise you right now, there's not a single person in this room that has tamed their tongue to the point that they won't be held guilty before God for the things they've said. There's not a single person in this room that has said only the right things, only the right way. They've only built up, they've never torn down. They've never said those things behind someone else's back. They've never said a word they shouldn't say. They've never, there's not a person in this room that could do that. And if you suppose you have, then if you look at the rest of what God has said about what we ought to do to keep his standard, and we'll find out very clearly that we're held accountable for those things also. So Jesus says, by your words you'll be acquitted, and by your words you'll be condemned. And so the reality is that on our own merit, all of us would be condemned. So what are the words, what is the way that we can be acquitted by our words? The Bible's really clear. Faith in Christ is how we can be saved. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, the Bible says you will be saved. And so how could sinners such as us, you know that was Isaiah's reaction when he encountered God? When, when Isaiah came before the holy God, before God called him to be a prophet, He said, woe to me, for I am a man of unclean lips from a people of unclean lips. All it took for him was to realize that just the things he said were enough to condemn him. God places a coal to his lip and and, and heals that part. But what is every person in the Old Testament that looks forward, that has faith? It is by faith in what God would do through Jesus, even though they didn't know it all yet. And for us, how can we be acquitted by our words? By confessing Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. By believing in your heart that God raised him from the dead. By placing your faith and your hope in Christ alone. Not in Christ and your own ability. Not in Christ and your ability to attend church. Not in Christ and your goodness. In Christ alone. And the question you have to ask today is have you done that? Have you placed your faith? Have you responded to what God has done? And if you have, as I know many of you have, and you've been following him faithfully, are you faithfully seeking to follow him, to be a tree that bears good fruit, that points to the Lord? Are you seeking to speak things that build up rather than tear down? Are you seeking to be a person that glorifies God by what you do and by what you say? And are you telling people that the only way that they can be saved is by placing their faith in Christ? The only way that we can be acquitted is by placing our faith in Christ because of what he's done, not because of what we've done. We're going to have a time of invitation in a moment. And that is an invitation to respond to God's working in your life. If you're a person who has never placed your faith in Christ, you've never reached out, you've never said, I need to be saved, you've never gone public with that, you've never put that in front of people, that's what God desires of you. To step forward and say, I was trying to do it on my own, I was trying to be good enough, I tried to follow God's law, but I can't, and I need to place my faith in Christ and in Christ alone. If you've never done that, that is what this time is for. If you've done that, but you've never followed in obedience by being baptized, by proclaiming, as as Isaac did last week, that I have been buried with Christ and raised to new life to say to the world, I am a believer, a follower in Christ. If you've never followed in obedience in baptism, what we believe very clearly that the Bible lays out is that baptism follows salvation. That was something I had to wrestle with in my life. I grew up in the Methodist church. I was baptized as a baby, and I got to a point where I was like, why have I not done what I see people doing in the Bible? 
And so I was baptized to follow in faithfulness. Maybe you need to join to be a part of a church family, a body. All of those things are what this time is for. And it's also a time to look at your life. And whether it's where you are, whether it's coming down to the altar to pray, whether it's praying with someone that's with you or across the sanctuary from you, it's a time to seek to do what God wants you to do, to honor him with your life, to glorify him with your life. And today is a little special. It's also a time to prepare your heart for participating in the Lord's Supper. We don't do this all the time. It's something that is infrequent in the Baptist church, but it's important. We remember what Christ has done. We remember the price that was paid. We remember the words that he spoke. And this is a time to get your heart right with God, to remember what he's done as we prepare for that. So we're going to pray. And then after we pray, you'll stand. But my prayer is that it's not just another routine that we do every Sunday where you stand and you sing and then you sit and then we do the Lord's Supper and then you go home and you forget about. Let God work in your heart. Let God show you the fruit that you ought to produce. Respond in whatever way God might be calling you to respond. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day you've given us. This time in which we can come together, that we can worship you, we can honor you, we can respond to what it is you've done in our lives and in our hearts. God, I pray that you would work in our hearts this morning, that you would show us your will, you would show us what you desire of us, and that you would show us what you want us to do. Father, I pray that you would move in this place, that you would convict us, not in a way that we despair, but in a way that we respond to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We hope this sermon has been a blessing to you today. If you have any questions about what you've heard, we would love to hear from you through our church Facebook page, email, or by calling the church office.